Gupta, Lead in Strategy Investment, Skyroot Aerospace. I welcome you all to the stage, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I request Chair and Moderator, Mr. M. S. Anurup, Director, STPO ISRO, to kindly come on the dais and speak a few lines. A very good afternoon, afternoon to you all. Uh, welcome to this session on evaluating launcher options, uh, especially uh, this is a very great time to be in the uh, domain of uh, space transportation systems. So uh, probably every one of my co-panelists and all who are sitting in the room will agree when I say that a launch vehicle is the most visible aspect of, a space, of any space program in any country. So you will, uh, the, you know, the, the kind of excitement that is generated when you hear the engines roar and then you feel that kind of excitement with the, uh, the, your co-colleagues and workers when they see their work getting launched and, uh, and finally till the end of the mission, the jubilation and the excitement on their faces. It is, it is really something that is worth experiencing. So welcome to this uh, session once again. So uh, to, uh, today, if you unlike the uh, previous decade or maybe early part of the previous decade where we had very little options uh, as far as uh, launch vehicles are concerned. Today we have various options available right from small satellite launchers uh, to uh, super heavy lift launch vehicles both concepts and demonstrators. So now if you see the private sector has been emerging as a major player in the space transportation scenario and they have been suitably encouraged by the space policy of their respective nations. And uh, uh, there is no doubt that a lot of innovation is coming into this scenario. Uh, the, this, uh, then the reusability is another factor that is, that is providing a perception of a, a reduced cost of access to space, uh, is at least at the moment. And so that is encouraging more and more investors to invest uh, in uh, uh, the uh, reusable launch vehicle systems and uh, the space community is more looking at more options to increase the frequency of access to space both for scientific and economic reasons. So if we look at the government spacefaring nations, probably they are, especially in the North American scenario, we can see a situation where they are retiring their global workforce launches, probably uh, they are more confident that the private sector has successfully demonstrated the operationalization of space transportation systems and reliably uh, lofting payloads into orbit. And, uh, and also we, we hear uh, from all reports and, and the kind of experiments that are going on, a lot of innovations like uh, you know, spin launch, co coaxial propellant tanks, all carbon composite launch vehicles, electric turbo pump uh, uh, fed, uh, uh, engines. So you have a lot of uh, innovation that is coming in, and so we and the new propellant combinations, then all uh, ro rockets uh, which is all 3D printed, so etc. So it's really an exciting time to be in, and it is no wonder that all through the world we have youngsters, startups, entrepreneurs, uh, all uh, starting uh, up activities in uh, space transportation systems. Even though, even though space transportation system is a minor percentage of the global space economy, we see a lot and lot of players getting into this rocket. More probably they share the excitement of, of, of that most visible aspect of our space program. So let us uh, so all go ahead uh, in the, this uh, panel uh, discussion. Uh, probably uh, we, we, today we are seeing a global shift towards small satellites. So, uh, especially because of these mega constellations for satellite broadband and all that. So uh, uh, there are maybe uh, over the last five to six years, we have more than 30 players trying to develop small satellite launch vehicles. And uh, still, uh, the reality is that only one or two have reached the kind of operation status, which clearly indicates the kind of challenges 
that uh, this scenario faces. So it is not easy to build a well, safe, reliable, operational space transportation system. Then uh, if we look at uh, the global launch scenario, uh, if it has demonstrated robust growth. Even during the pandemic year, the, uh, the world has clocked around 114 launches in 2020 and uh, more than 144 launches in 2021. And it is already reached 125 to 126 launches in 2022 by the end of September. So if you look at multiple uh, launch services market uh, research firms, they are all uh, indicating something in the order of uh, 11 to 12 billion dollars in 2022 alone. And, and they are projecting something like 30 to 40 billion dollars in the space launch services market by 2030. Of course, there are uh, differences in their predictions. but. All of them seem to agree on a CAGR of around 12 to 15 percent for this scenario. So, so if we if we look at it, the Leo launches are increasing. The Geo launches are probably showing a decreasing trend. So, uh, the Leo launches, of course, uh, is now dominated. Around 77 percent of the Leo launches are more focused on these mega satellite constellations. And the market driver is, of course, again, the mega satellite constellations and more and more private investment going into these uh, space transportation systems. So with this background, I invite uh, uh, Mr. Logan to deliver his keynote. And probably based on the insights that he has to offer, we will proceed with the uh, further discussions. Over to you, Mr. Logan. Good afternoon. I'm Logan Ware from Blue Origin. I lead uh, international business development at Blue Origin. Uh, a primary focus of that business development is on our launch systems. Uh, and it's been an incredible year at Blue Origin. Uh, so just to familiarize everyone here with what Blue Origin does and what our vision is, start with kind of the why. Blue Origin envisions uh, a future where millions of people are living and working in space. And they're living and working in space in order to benefit Earth. And I see that vision as being, in many ways, very parallel to the, the, the vision here in the, the burgeoning space uh, industry in India which is quite exciting to us. Uh, and, and me and my, my colleague, uh, George, who, who came here uh, from our advanced development programs at Blue Origin, are really kind of excited about the potential for collaboration, both with uh, institutional uh, players here in India, as well as uh, industrial players here in India. So with the vision that Blue Origin has, we're taking steps to build that road to space. We see that as being three primary steps. The first step is drastically reducing the cost of access to space. And we see the best way to do that is through reusability, reusable launchers. Uh, the second step is utilizing the resources that are in space. Uh, we want to go back to the moon. And we want to utilize the resources that are on the moon, the regolith, the water ice, uh, and maybe convert it into propellants, maybe convert it into useful resources uh, to develop a, a permanent presence, uh, both on the moon and uh, in space. And then the, the third aspect is these are very ambitious projects, the, the projects that ISRO uh, and the industry in India are undertaking, as well as what, what we're seeing in the U.S. with many of the, the commercial players. These are multi-generational projects. So the third step is inspiring the next generation. If, if we are unsuccessful in inspiring the next generation to work in uh, STEM or STEAM fields, we will plateau our efforts to expanding out into the universe in, in order to essentially kind of protect our planet. So that's, that's kind of Blue Origin overall, uh, what our, our, our vision and our mission is as an overview. 
We have four programs at Blue Origin. We've taken a step-by-step -step approach. In, in the first program we started was a suborbital rocket. A suborbital rocket is called New Shepard. Uh, it essentially goes above the Kármán line. Uh, and since mid last year, in July of last year, we flew our founder, Jeff Bezos, to space. Uh, and he came back incredibly excited about the experience. And since then, in just over a year, we've flown 31 astronauts to space on New Shepard. And that is the same vehicle. So we turned a reusable vehicle around six times in order to launch 31 astronauts to space. So for, for us, this is something we're incredibly proud of. In, in many ways, this proves out the, the case of reusability uh, and turning a vehicle around quickly. Uh, and then that has, that learning has fed forward to our orbital rocket system, which is New Glenn, uh, which I'm going to come back to and spend quite a bit of time on, uh, maybe not too long. Uh, the third program that we have is our engines program. And we have four engine development programs within our engines business unit, and those support New Glenn, and they support New Shepard, and they support our fourth business unit, uh, which is advanced development programs. This is getting back to the moon. This is uh, what was talked about during the human spaceflight panel by my, my colleague George <coughs> Wayneman. Uh, Orbital Reef uh, is part of advanced development at, at Blue Origin, and uh, the engine systems kind of support the whole ecosystem of, of products that we're building at, at Blue Origin. So for the purposes of today's conversation, I'll focus in a little bit on New Glenn. And New Glenn, uh, it's, the last year has been incredible, but especially over the last three months, we've seen a significant amount of change and progression in the program. So. That is threefold. We are deep into our qualification campaign of all of the hardware. Uh, for m many of the people that are attending this Congress would be very interested in uh, the payload accommodations, the payload fairing, the payload adapter. Um, we have made incredible progress in both the, the development of, of, of that subsystem as well as building hardware for our initial launches. Uh, we completed two qualification jettison tests of our payload fairing, which is a very, very, very large seven meter diameter fairing. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. New Glenn, comparatively to our suborbital system, the payload fairing can fit the entire New Shepard suborbital rocket into that seven meter fairing. <laughs> uh, so, Qualification is coming along really, really well. And then uh, construction of both flight hardware and our launch facilities has uh, completely transformed over the last year. We have completed our launch site 36 uh, down in Florida in Cape Canaveral. Uh, we have completed our uh, payload and uh, vehicle processing facilities where we plan to process uh, three New Glenn stage ones uh, in that in that processing facility that is just near the, the launch pad there in Florida. Uh, and very recently, we have built hardware for a commercial customer of our BE4 engine, which is the engine that uh, supports New Glenn. Uh, there are seven of those engines on New Glenn, and there are two engines on ULA's Vulcan rocket. Uh, and we have delivered the first uh, of those flight engines to ULA. And check out Twitter. Tori Bruno is hugging the engine. It's like a very, very, very large, sparkly, brand spanking new engine. Uh, that's like a, a, a indicative of an engagement uh, ring in the United States between us and, and our, our, uh, uh, our customer that we're very proud to have, which is ULA uh, for our engines program. So building a lot of hardware. And then for the topic of this discussion, we're also building a backlog. So it's an incredibly exciting time to, to be a launcher in this industry. 
Uh, demand has never been so high. The demand is back. Uh, so it's, it's, we see as being a very exciting time. In April, we uh, announced that we were selected by Amazon Kuiper to deliver 12 launches of their Kuiper Constellation with 15 options. Uh, we're very excited about uh, Kuiper's <coughs> very ambitious project, uh, deploying broadband across the world. Uh, and we're very proud to have them as a customer. So just to kind of close out the, the keynote here, we're excited. We're excited that there are other launchers in the mix. Uh, we're excited that uh, the satellite industry is changing. Uh, we, we have seen what I would say is the, the geo demand has, I think, has maybe tapered off. It's, it's maybe declined. Uh, and, and we're still very bullish of, about geo. Uh, but now there's interest in other orbits. Uh, there's interest in LEO. And uh, we see it as being a very exciting time. And uh, from a capacity perspective, right now, uh, it may be seeming a little bit capacity constrained to, to many satellite operators, but that uh, as, as some of these other vehicles come online and very, very large systems like New Glenn start to increase their, their rate of launch, uh, I, I think they'll flight. And they are not really focusing on a business model for the suborbital space transportation. But Blue Origin has taken a different path. If you see that you have built space tourism as a market, probably in the suborbital space. And from then on, uh, you have been moving on to the orbital space. Whereas if you look at the other companies, they are more anxious to get into the orbital space than the suborbital space. So, uh, would you like to throw some insight on that, whether Blue Origin has consciously taken such a decision or, uh, because if I look the earlier websites of uh, Blue Origin, so they had this, you know, this, uh, your BE, your engine development followed by the, the uh, space tourism market and of course New Blood. So, uh, so then uh, uh, I feel there is some conscious uh, path to that, but would you like to throw a little more insight? Yeah, I, I, that is absolutely intentional. So uh, within our DNA at Blue Origin, we have, uh, uh, we have a motto within our company. It's, it's, it's a Latin phrase, and it's gratatum ferociter, which translated to English means step-by-step step ferociously. So the, what you're bringing up is kind of twofold. There's the human spaceflight aspect, which is very, very, very aligned to our mission of millions of people living and working in space in order to benefit Earth. There's also the, the step that we talked about earlier, which is drastically reducing the cost of access to space, uh, and that's done through reusability. So what we decided to do in, in order to uh, get to orbital flights, uh, we designed a system which is liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, which is not necessary to go to suborbital space. Uh, it's actually much, much, much harder to build a system that is liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, cryogenics. Uh, but we did it anyway because we knew that we would need to have that in place for our orbital flights. So a short answer, we're taking this uh, incrementally, step-by-step uh, -step approach, both for reusability, reducing the cost of access to space, which we've also learned to turn the New Shepard vehicle around, which is a suborbital vehicle, uh, and we're gonna take that learning to New Glenn and turn that vehicle around and scale our cadence very quickly as well. And uh, just one more question. Uh, uh, the, if you look at the, you know, the recent reports, Blue Origin has been competing for a lunar uh, capability as well. It is not just getting to the moon, but for all for the, you know, the blue, what do you call that, blue moon on, on uh, lunar space transporter or what, something like that. So, but do you think uh, other than the space transportation, uh, is there an, a development of infrastructure required some, somewhere in the cis lunar space where you have 
refueling stations you know that the whole gamut of it is not just enough that we the design space transportation system if you have to sustain those space transportation with the capabilities is blue origin looking at a more bigger picture that developing the cis lunar space environment to have you know orbiting space stations or something that supports a sus more sustainable way of space transportation in situ or uh, fuel uh, synthesis or whatever so it's just more like a futuristic question but do you have that kind of a thinking the other just other than space transportation an ecosystem that tries to sustain the space transportation to lunar and beyond so is there such kind of a thinking happening in blue origin yeah so so the moon and going back to the moon in a sustainable and permanent way is our number one priority at Blue Origin. We would uh, uh, be remiss to say that there, there was a nether or a better place to go to get the resources that we think that we need in order to start to develop a presence in space that protects the planet uh, that, that we live on today. So it's very top of mind for us. And the, the permanence aspect of that, lunar permanence, will require a significant amount of infrastructure but between uh, launch systems, uh, transportation elements, uh, whether they're landers or other, maybe there is uh, some, some refueling. It, there, is, uh, the, there are lots of concepts for, for how to do this in a sustainable way. Uh, Blue Origin is, is very ambitious to ensure that we figure out a way to do this sustainably. Um, and, and that's very aligned, like I said, to, to our, our vision and mission. And uh, from some of what I'm hearing, uh, even during this Congress from uh, the, Dr. Uma uh, <laughs> at, uh, at ISRO, the colleague, um, as well as uh, hearing Dr. Somanath talk uh, earlier this week, it seems very aligned to the ambitions of uh, developing a sustainable presence in space for the human spaceflight program at, at ISRO and within India, and uh, probably much of what the uh, industrial or kind of new space ecosystem in India is thinking about. So I'd, I'd be interested in some of what the other panelists think of, uh, about that topic as well. Okay, thank you, Logan. I'll probably ask Kunal. Because if you look at the new generation of uh, launchers that are being built today, almost all of them are uh, uh, liquid rockets. But whereas Skyroot has taken a more uh, heritage-driven path of uh, starting from solid propulsion. So could you please elaborate on, on that strategy that you have taken? Why you have chosen solid propulsion for your launchers? Is it is it more related to the time to market kind of, uh, of a scenario or do you have any other uh, strategy? Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, just for the audience, I am Kunal Gupta. I had a strategy and investments at Skyroot Aerospace. Uh, we're building a platform of launch vehicles called the Vikram Launch Platform. Uh, it's named after the father of India's space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. And the entire platform comprises of Vikram 1, 2, and 3. Uh, there are three different launch vehicles, a single platform, uh, that will allow us to carry payloads ranging from, let's say, about 400 kilograms to about 800 kilograms to low inclination orbits in the area. Uh, so as far as the, 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 the design architecture is concerned, um, we took stock, we studied, we learned from a lot of uh, our, our, our uh, you know, uh, from a lot of players in the US, we learned from a lot of existing operation players. So a lot of, I would say, a lot of parameters went into, uh, you know, our final design architecture. But from a very big picture standpoint, I would say go to market was definitely one um, area. We can't, we couldn't have waited for at least more than eight years or 10 years to get to market. So we needed to get to market quickly. We needed, uh, especially with the Vikram 1, uh, we needed, uh, you know, the architecture is such that allows us to get to market quickly. And also the, the, the subsystems are such with fairly richer flight heritage, you know, that allows us to mitigate or allows us to um, uh, mitigate any concerns that the customer might have, especially when the vehicle is not 
tested. The vehicle will be tested next sometime next year uh, during the first uh, you know, during the first launch uh, that is planned for Vikram 1. So the, again, multiple design considerations went into it. Uh, 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 but the focus was how do we reduce technical risk, mitigate customer concerns, uh, and, and, and of course, how, to, how do we get to market. So these were the, from a big picture standpoint, these were the, this was the main reason why we chose the architecture that we did. And you know, with Vikram 1, 2, and 3, the architecture is slightly different. So of course, we're, we're, we're going to be upgrading certain systems and subsystems, and that's how it's going to play out. Yeah. yeah, so I just have one more uh, uh, question for you. That is, recently we have been reading reports that Skyroot is attracting a lot of investments. So what is it that uh, the investors are seeing in Skyroot so for them to, you know, uh, post confidence in your strategy? Uh, or uh, do you think that that this, there is a business case in uh, uh, you know uh, investing in uh, Skyroot, and uh, there is a, there is indeed a market out there for uh, small satellites that and there is a market share that needs that can be easily grabbed if Skyroot uh, is uh, comes out as a proven launch vehicle. Right. Uh, thank you for the question, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, the investors. Uh, I mean, they consider a wide variety of parameters. Uh, so one of them, uh, of course, given that we are in a nascent industry, we're in a nascent firm, and we are yet to launch. So one of the primary factors that they look at is the team, right? I mean, if we look at launch, the, the science is very well known, but only seven countries in the world right now have capabilities to launch. So in this domain, execution is, is key. You know, and the kind of hands-on experience that your team has. So, uh, so that is one parameter that uh, investors definitely do look at, especially during the early stages of, not only for us, it will be across the board for any new space company coming out of India. Uh, the second bit is, what, are, what is the progress that the company has made? Data by satellite uh, constellation developers. Over the next decade, we expect more than 30,000 satellites to be launched. This is actually starting. Uh, these are small satellites, essentially under 500 kilograms. Uh, and even if we capture, let's say, a fair share, or you know, let's say, a, a reasonable share, uh, there is enough demand for uh, you know, vehicles like us. And just to point out in terms of what's happening in the market, the way we see it at least, uh, you know, over the last decade, satellite sizes have been reduced. Uh, or <coughs> last couple of decades. So over the last, in the last decade, at least, the yeah, average satellite size. Yeah, the satellite size reduced from you know roughly about three tons to uh, this is between 2011 and 2020 from three tons to about 100 to 100 kilograms, and we expect this trend to continue over the next decade. Now we also see that instead of a satellite operators launching single satellite, they're launching constellations of satellites. And to those who don't know, they're launching bundles of smaller satellites. And these satellite operators, they want their satellites to be up and operational as quickly as, you know, as, as possible. They can't wait for 8 to 12 months uh, before that next launch happens. So that's where, you know, people like us, people like uh, you know, a more dedicated launch service, we provide greater control over launch, we do our customers, and, uh, and it's not that. Yeah. Also, you know, space is not a single destination. Our customers want to be precise of it, especially if uh, SSPO and LEO are contributing to They start crowding. More of it's going to be explored. And that's where our value comes in. We deliver payloads to precise corporate destinations. We sort of deliver payloads precisely where our customers want to go. So, in essence, I mean, we're uberizing space. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the way we look at ourselves. Thank you, Kunal. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Mahmoud uh, here. Uh, and uh, he, he, unlike the other space startups that we have in India, he has taken a more different strategy where he's, he's directly going to a medium lift uh, launch vehicle. So, can you please throw some insight into why he chose a strategy that is not as stabilized a couple as uh, Mr. Logan said or Maybe derive some, uh, you know, response. Uh, so, so I, I leave that. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, I mean, at ETLX, we um, we thought carefully before we started off with the project. We carefully evaluated um, what category to start with. But um, I would like to start off with saying, um, like Logan said here, and uh, it's. The market is back, 
Right. Um, we've seen that the growth of Leo has significantly increased. But what's going to happen? Okay, so let's start with why did small sats come into picture in the first place? How did small uh, small sats uh, take birth? There wasn't enough bigger launch vehicles to take satellites into space, so satellites had to be miniaturized. And from 2001 to 2004, um, building small sats increased the small sat uh, project cost by 24 percent, 25 percent, including launch costs. So the project cost, inclusive of the launch cost, had increased because of the miniaturization of uh, satellites. Now, subsequently, what happened is uh, the trend of having small sats um, accommodated, uh, being accommodated into small, smaller vehicles um, came into picture, and uh, this has been continuing very well. And I think this has to continue very well because it's served humanity pretty well. Okay. But, however, what happens when all the constellations um, are having to, you know, uh, launch within the next uh, seven, eight years. Who's who's going to keep? So, okay, so uh, let's think about seven projects that have been announced, uh, 12 projects that have been announced for the next 10 years. The, the combined payload capacity uh, that they've announced is about 7,000 tons in the next 10 years. But let's not be optimistic. Let's take about 50% of that. Let's, let's say 3,500 tons to space. Who's going to keep to the demand? Right. The, the whole ball game with uh, a small sat, uh, launch vehicles right at this point is going to be frequency and accessibility. You can get it quick and you can get into orbit quickly. But the delay came into picture because of lack of medium lift or heavier capacity launch vehicles like Logan said earlier. When two or three major reusable medium lift players come into picture, that bubble would then burst, right? What happens next? So at the end of the day, when you, when you look at it, um, let's uh, take examples of um, uh, some of the companies that we know of. Rocket Labs um, or Astra, they've been in existence since 2013, uh, I mean, uh, at least Rocket Labs. Uh, in, once they flew uh, their first ever rocket, uh, in, the last, um, uh, in the last seven years, they've done about 22 launches. And now they've uh, halted Electron. They, uh, I mean, they've, they're pushing off Electron and they're trying to come up with Neutron. And uh, I remember earlier, um, uh, he, uh, Patrick, he was like, um, you know what, uh, if I ever move into medium lift launch vehicles, I will eat my hat. And this year, when he was announcing Neutron, he started off with branding his hat into a mixer and then having it. Because that's, that's, uh, he, and Neutron was a vehicle that was yelled at them by the market, by the customers. Because it's, the, the revenue model is now going from the business model. The innovative business model is now going from, revenue, uh, from it's transitioning from revenue per launch to revenue per launch vehicle. Right. You are now building one vehicle and then generating revenue out of that vehicle from a launcher's perspective. But uh, from a satellite uh, manufacturer's perspective, it's about <coughs> how efficient or how cheaper and um, how many, uh, uh, depending on the configuration on, and, and architecture, of course, how many, at, at what long, at the minimal number of launches you need to get your fleet into space. You don't want to be launching over and over again. That's also going to push your time on by great margins. So, um, even Astra, so there was CNBC yesterday. They, they, put, um, they put out an article um, where even founders of Astra were like, they halted, they, they halted their uh, initial vehicle that they tested. And that was also because the market is now yelling at them for a medium size vehicle or for a much larger build capacity. So, um, it's, the market is there for small sat vehicles, and the market is there globally for launchers. Like, like Logan uh, said, it's, it's, a, it's a good time to be a launcher in this industry. But we're looking at a project that's going to take us six, seven years for us to get into the market, right? at least. Now, we need to be thinking about what is the market then when we're entering after seven years? The boom for Leo is right now. 
the boom for small sap is right now. And um, when when it's it's I don't know how um, how it takes to you know convince that the the small sap is going to be the next big thing because um, we can see that the world is moving towards. Um, you know, bigger payload um, activities, be lunar exploration, setting up uh, habitats, uh, setting up, uh, you know, in orbit uh, space stations, all of this require much bigger capacity. And, and if we are to establish ourselves uh, in the top, um, to, you know, make a statement and also uh, to be actively contributing to civilizational progress, then I think this is the way to go. Okay, so in other words, you are saying you are looking at a more long-term perspective and so going beyond uh, when the mega star constellations are in operation and 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 you are maybe you are forecasting that after this initial wave of launches for completing the mega constellations, there is a business case for meeting with launch vehicles, uh, and the the business for small size launch vehicles may no longer be there. This is. Is this what you are expecting or...? No, uh, okay, let's assume there is a business for small sats at, um, vehicles at this point. What happens when there are four to five high-frequency reusable medium lift operators? That's, that's the question that we need to ask, right? Uh, because we, we get to that. Yeah. Yeah. that, that. Sure. We, we reserve it for the next problem. We talk about the economics of all the things. So, how may I do that? Get the first initial response from Arushi here from Agnipuri. So, Agnipuri is really working on an innovative liquid, on liquid rocket. And what is it that you want to offer to your customers as far as launch services are concerned? And are you going to offer not a fast turnaround time? Or a heavier payload, or do you have a strategy in place for moving from small size capability to medium So, we would like to listen to your clients. So, hello. Uh, so, I'm Arushi from Agnikul, and uh, as you all know, Agnikul is a small satellite launch vehicle, and it uh, provides a payload capacity of 100 kgs. So, as uh, Sir asked, like our uh, main goal or uh, main USP, I should say, uh, it is to provide a faster turnaround time. We are planning to uh, make a vehicle and provide it to customers in just two weeks. And it is possible for us because we have a 3D printed engine, which can be printed in just two days. So we can have a newly 3D printed engine in just two days and uh, build the entire vehicle in just two weeks. So if uh, there is a need for a customer uh, that they want to launch a satellite just in the, let's say in the next week, so or, or let's say at the end of the month, we can, uh, we can uh, after uh, placing the order, we can provide them the vehicle in just two weeks. So that is what we are trying to offer. Uh, there is one more uh, uh, one more thing that I wanted to uh, tell about uh, Agni Baan. Agni Baan is our vehicle name. So Agni Baan is basically configurable. So what that means is uh, our first stage has seven engines, seven cluster engines. So we are uh, we are we are trying to configure the engine according to the customer's need. So if their payload is less we will provide only four engines to it. So that would reduce the fill of materials because our avionics is completely uh, distributed. Like we have uh, distributed uh, uh, systems, modular systems I should say. So we will remove the three engines. So let's say we have total of seven engines. We will remove three of the engines and uh, give the vehicle with only four engines. And remove all the avionics related to the uh, three engines. So that would reduce the bill of material, that would reduce the time it will take uh, for the vehicle to be made and they will basically have their own vehicle, own customized vehicle. So I think uh, uh, Mr. Logan mentioned the Uberizing the uh, uh, space. So we, we are basically trying to provide a Uber or Ola cap uh, for customers. So I think uh, that is the USP we are trying to offer. 
Thank you, Arushi. So probably yeah, in the next round, I would like to have a clarity on this economics of use of G because now we are all uh, uh, talking about incorporating reusability in launch vehicles. So the economics don't seem to be in agreement as far as the, the interpreter on reusability is concerned. So here, if you see, we just recently had plans uh, uh, through a paper on uh, reusability where it is clearly said that the, that the number of launches, even if none of the best investment and interpreters and all that, has to be at least 15 to 20 or under worst case conditions it has to be at least 100 launches per year. So unless we have a market, launch services market that size, the, the, the economics of reusability is always under question. So do you agree that Mr. Gordon is there such a market or do you still think that reusability is, is indeed the way forward? Yeah, reusability is everything to us when it comes to reducing costs. Uh, it, it, you don't want to have to replace an engine uh, every single time, especially for very, very large launch vehicles. Uh, you don't want to have to replace all of the hardware every time. Um, so what we think is reusability, number one, reduces cost in hardware, uh, but it also reduces cost in the uh, amount of time it's going to take to so you can also have a, a higher scale, a higher volume, and with very large launchers, what, what we're uh, seeing is that uh, like our seven meter fairing and very, very, very high sea level thrust uh, capability of the vehicle, this is just more efficiency and mass to work in. So overall, we see this as delivering value, significant value to no, uh, can I say that if you look at companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin, in uh, addition to their uh, uh, launcher projects, you have also announced uh, mega constellations. So, so if I interpret this way, right? Uh, like, okay, you you have you are your own anchor customer as far as launch vehicles is concerned, like Blue Origin, yes, if you think at the, the market demand. And then, of course, you have a different business model where the Blue Origin or a sister concern of Blue Origin launches a mega constellation of satellites, like what SpaceX is doing. These launch installing and maybe Amazon Squeaker constellation is there. And of course, that and the launch market for that constellation is, of course, tied to be most likely to be tied with Blue Origin. So unless, uh, uh, do you suggest that or for reusable space transportation to be successful, do, is it uh, really required to create a sort of vertically integrated company where you have, you create a your own anchor customer or something of that sort? So I think my with this award for Kuiper uh, as a customer for us uh, is, is very basically a, a product market fit. Um, so uh, we, we see Kuiper has selected multiple vehicles. Uh, we got a lot of those launches. We're very, very happy about that. Uh, but that is, that is, a, that is strictly a, a customer that we're very proud to have. So I, that's, that's uh, kind of separate from vertical integration in, in the sense of uh, startup. What I, I'll kind of expand a bit there. The, the market fit there is we have a very, very, very large fairing. We have a lot of performance to LEO, uh, and for these LEO constellations, that's kind of ideal when it comes to cost per satellite. So uh, that's adding value to uh, Amazon Hyper. Uh, and in many ways, that's adding value <coughs> us having built up a backlog, uh, a backlog gives us uh, significant confidence to, to scale uh, and as we scale we can then provide more capability, uh, more launches to uh, 
anything else that wants to go to space. It's interesting, you know, uh, a lot of what I've been hearing since I've been here is all of these new space mobility platforms, uh, many of them kind of emerging here uh, in the new space industry in India. Uh, that's great. That's just more to send to space. So again, for launchers, this is this is a uh, this is very good for us. Yeah. So again, if we, I slightly extend that question a little bit. Uh, probably it's more of an uh, open question here. So if we uh, look at the mega constellations, it's more it's mainly two things are there. One is Starlink, and maybe one web, and uh, uh, Amazon's upcoming uh, constellations. So if you see uh, the two major in terms of numbers, if you see maybe the Amazon's Kuiper and uh, Starlink. So that that market is gone because they have their own market. Okay, so you have the remaining market. So even though you say that uh, 8,600 satellites are going to be launched in a span of seven years with 800 satellites per year and all that, do you think there is a market large enough for these uh, crowded, because uh, I mean the crowded space of small satellite launches? Right? Because we expect realistically that the the launch market is only is other is only the existing launch market is other than starting core. So uh, you know, a we factor in the that you know that certain in, in, when when estimating the kind out of the total available market, what can be service? This analysis has been done and factor in thereafter uh, what, what can we effectively compete for? So that, that that's where. The, 30, based on how the market plays out, there are certain uncertainties, no doubt, uh, which are associated with the new and fairly nascent uh, space review. So we do see demand over the next decade, and what's uh, what's even better is that you know what we, what we see is going to happen over the next decade is as cost to access space comes down, which is one of the major you know inhibitors uh, for space-based solutions today. For whatever reason, so it could be space it could be blue origin, you know, as collectively as we sort of get cost to space uh, down, we expect a lot of latent demand to sort of get triggered over the map over the coming decade. So these 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 figures that are quoting is based on the visibility that we have right now. So we have strong faith in the market that will once cost to space comes down, and as it is. Uh, there's a role for small uh, satellite launches to play, there's a role to be easily, definitely. And as uh, again, as cost comes down, there's a lot of people who want that, that will get unleashed, uh, you know, thereafter. So similar to the telecom industry, right? as cost of making the phone call came down, India leaped out, right? So we do we, we do uh, see that happening. We also see, uh, uh, in terms of let's say over the next decade, we see that you know for the downstream demand. Uh, so we are a bunch of upstream guys. That would be satellite operators, launch vehicle service providers such as us, and satellite manufacturers. So we are the upstream infrastructure providers. The downstream would be telecoms. The downstream guys are the people turn key solutions. So it's our duty as upstream guys, and you know what we are, what we see over the next decade is, to, you know, through partnerships, providing turn key solutions to downstream players that will trigger more across the board. So that's what that's our take. So uh, next, uh, maybe Arushi also. Uh, yeah. 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 If you look at, are there any, are you foreseeing any disruptors in this small satellite launch market? Because we are, we are looking at the Norwich space transportation system, space taxis, dedicated ride share missions on uh, heavier rockets, who are offering maybe $5,000 per kg. Yes, someone observed in some article that prices are going down, maybe the costs are not going down. So, if you, uh, do you think that that's, there are some disruptors is in the short term, um, because by the time you arrive in the market, the, all these space taxis and other things, you know, they take over as Ubers and Olas, and they get launched on medium lift park, uh, you know, rockets, and then they go around, uh, you know, uh, uh, providing uh, or, or space access and all that. So, do you think they are going to disrupt this small satellite launch of space? So, uh, yeah, there is always a uh, chance that there is someone or some some other company that is more innovative than you uh, that might take 
over the things that you are trying to do. But that is where you have to innovate and you have to continuously keep changing your technologies to accommodate the market. So I would say uh, right now we are focused on making a small sat satellite uh, launch vehicle because that is the current need. And uh, in future if there is new uh, innovation, so we are trying to uh, include the new technologies or, or, or let's say like we are trying to focus on the newer technologies uh, as in when, where we could because uh, radionics uh, or, or any other systems that uh, you see are propulsion techniques are mostly focused on the newer technologies. So I would say if there is, uh, again, the battery systems, there are multiple uh, areas where there is continuously innovation happening and there will be new things that would emerge. So we as a company would try to incorporate that in the future. Uh, with with respect to disruptors, I think uh, the major disruptor would be grounding of EU. I think if that, that is one of the uh, things we are, we are uh, worried about. I think all the small satellite or EU uh, satellite customers would be worried about. But I think there will be steps taken for that as well because we are trying to bring back the satellites that have stopped working. <coughs> So basically, uh, that that itself is providing a market to a different set of uh, uh, you know different set of uh, companies to come in uh, companies which can actually bring back the satellites. Uh, so I think there will be different uh, technologies emerging. We just have to adapt. We just have to include that in our own uh, uh, you know in in our own space. Well, we can't stop on the future market disruptors to the small satellite launch by Vartech or even your medium wave. By the time maybe some eight years down the line, there could be other market disruptors. So are you foreseeing any any disruptors to the launch market? Yeah. Well, um, no, even there is assuming that you know more future uh, uh, even blue origin comes up with these 25 times reusable uh, rocket. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they are ready to launch uh, maybe uh, several, uh, several satellites at one go. So then by the time uh, you qualify your launch vehicle, they dedicate a ride share missions on <coughs> super heavy lift. That becomes a model and a low cost model. So are you... Yeah. Essentially speaking, um, at the end of the day, I think every launcher, everyone on this panel, uh, we all want to re reduce the cost to get to space, right? Uh, and that's the ultimate goal. Uh, it's about leveling the play field. And um, when when we are talking about disruptors, well, we see that in space services has been significantly growing, uh, be it deorbiting or re refueling in orbit, or you know even orbital re for uh, in, in in inhabiting space in orbit. So all of these are going to disrupt the market because right now they're all projections, we, we all consider projections, but when one of them is executed, um, you you will see how others will follow. Um, crowding of Leo is a general concern. Uh, that must be taken into consideration. Um, and there are uh, disruptors working on trying to actively reduce uh, the effects of crowding of Leo or trying to um, uh, take advantage of other orbits. Um, and that must be also, you know, very carefully looked after. And like you asked, if you're going to talk about ride share um, on medium or heavy lift launch vehicles, yes, that's that's something that we're going to offer. Uh, the way we are building our launch vehicle itself, though we can take about 24.8 tons in expendable condition. The reason why we call ourselves a medium lift r rocket is because in a reusable configuration, we have designed it to. Uh, designed for it to take it, uh, take about 22.8 tons to Leo, right? The resultant payload capacity loss in expandable and reusable configuration is only two tons, and that's where we play our own uh, uh, game. And, um, and 22 uh, is a little closer towards 20, so medium. But again, like like Logan earlier mentioned, that's an interesting point to know fairing size. Uh, like you need to recollect the, the point I mentioned. Um, how small sats to bird. So it's called, uh, in when you're designing a satellite, it's called the wiggle room for satellites. 
So a wiggle room for a satellite is much more uh, when you have much uh, higher payload uh, volume in your launch vehicle. And that eases a lot of things for satellite manufacturers, be it for constellation um, or mega constellations. So um, I think disruptors would always be there. And um, in fact, that's what we are looking for. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, when you know when the first ever diesel rocket was flown, that was also a disruptor. Um, and it also depends on how we are going, how what what are we terming as a disruptor? Are we talking about revenue generation? Are we talking about um, technological disruption? So um, it's only very ev not every great idea is a money making idea, but not every money making idea is a great idea. So it's a trade off between the two. That, would, that we'll have to see and you know, term what disruption would mean. So I think either way disruption would go hand in hand and that's exactly what players like us would like and, and try and take advantage of, yeah. I might briefly add, you know, when it comes to disruptors, maybe separate from like the market dynamics, there's, there's also technology that is going into these launch systems, both from uh, advanced manufacturing perspective, uh, advanced material science perspective, to help enable more and more and more reusability. Uh, so uh, as that science progresses, uh, we're, that, that will then, just like in any industry that has uh, progressed since you know, the early 1900s, it's more and more science is an enabler for, in, in this, uh, in this industry, more and more reusability and, and continuing to reduce cost. And then the, the last thing that I'll add is there's also uh, a, a lot of probably differentiation that is an outcome of flying a lot. So when you get a lot of experience turning a vehicle around or operating a system over and over and over, uh, that, that's also differentiation. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Logan and maybe more and Mr. Manu also has brought about a very really important point here that irrespective of the market demand or the market expectations, a lot of advanced technologies, whether it is for manufacturing or new ideas, <coughs> are getting into these space-based transportation systems. And these technologies could be stepping stones for more advanced technologies may help other domains as well as we know. And probably, uh, as you rightly pointed out, the ex more experience that we be um, turning around these systems, flying more and more, may result in more better ideas, more cost-effective technologies again coming and feeding back into it. And then probably this may result in more significant advances in space. Yeah, um, I would like to, uh, I mean, uh, it's a chicken egg situation, you know. Um, when you look at uh, startups that are trying to build constellations or trying to build disruptive technologies, they're also actively looking for launchers who can enable their technology to be in orbit. And we as launchers are looking for more and more constellations and more and more um, disruptive uh, in-space services or anybody else uh, to, who want to get into space or moon or anywhere else. So I think... Uh, we, we also need to look at it as um, a complementary dynamics between the provide, uh, between the enabler and um, who, the, and the executor. So it's 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 like that. I mean, once you once you facilitate, like you wouldn't sell um, oil in a country where there, there are no cars. So it's it, it's something like that. So um, yeah, it, it's <laughs> it, disruption. I would say it's not just in terms of um, market, but you need to make sure that you're bringing out new technologies that would enable for the market disruption to even happen. Okay, so probably uh, we limit our discussions at this uh, point because we are so reaching the end of our session. So uh, we'll take some a few questions, uh, two or three questions from the audience. Uh, before we close the uh, panel discussion, yeah, maybe more. Hi, it was a really interesting panel. My question.
sentence to the blue origin. Uh, I read up on this news in 2019 when Jeff Bezos unveiled the lunar lander, right? So, like, they, I know everyone has this question, so why, when can we expect that lunar can actually launch and show a demonstration? Thanks for the question. Uh, and, and I'm glad you bring Lunar up again. A, a lot of these launch systems are, are enablers to space exploration uh, and, and our ambition to, to go back to the moon. Uh, without being specific, uh, I'll say when we're ready. Uh, what we do at Blue Origin is we build safe, reliable, and affordable systems. Uh, and, and that takes time. Uh, and what we think is taking these step-by-step -step approaches will then help us to move very quickly and take those steps very quickly uh, down the road. So uh, you know, learning about cryogenics with liquid oxygen uh, and liquid hydrogen, that, that is an enabler to move faster down the road. Uh, building reusable systems, that's an enabler to moving faster down the road. So uh, we're picking up steam. We have scaled our company very, very, very quickly. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're, we're now over 9,000 people at Blue Origin. I, I feel like it was just a, a month or so ago when I was telling everybody that we are over 8,000 people now at Blue Origin. Uh, so we're scaling very quickly. Uh, and, and those resources uh, and, and this, this ethos that we have at Blue of Rotom Ferocit or uh, is an enabler to get back to the moon very quickly. Yeah, you, you had a question? You can go ahead. Hello, um, thank you for this great panel. Uh, my question is directly to Kunal and Arashi. So you both said that uh, you would be providing Google services. To so I wanted to know how feasible it would be for players, new players coming into the industry. Uh, taking an Uber, private Uber for themselves, or taking a ride share. So which would be more feasible, and how would you be helping them for a ride share? So if there is, there is different orbit of instructions. So yeah, I'd like to uh, So like I said, our vehicle is configurable. Agniban is configurable. So if they want a, ve uh, a vehicle specifically for them, let's say their payload capacity is only 30 kgs and they want to go to uh, some lower earth orbit, uh, let's say, uh, I would say uh, somewhere three, uh, 300 to 700, somewhere between that. Uh, I would ask them to have only four engines in our vehicle go with four engine configuration for our vehicle and go ahead and take that as a vehicle and it will be ready in two weeks. So if you say right share, they will have to wait for some time because they will have to wait for the other customers to be ready, other satellite customers to be ready and since the, uh, the vehicle itself would be bigger, it would take some time to uh, you know, be ready after the order, like after the, uh, the order is placed, like uh, the satellite customer asked for the vehicle. It will take some time for the vehicle to be made and plus the other customers that have to be there. But in the in our vehicle, we will just offer uh, the four engine configuration, get the vehicle ready in just two weeks and provide them uh, as a Uber, if you will. So I, I think that is how we might help. So if they want higher payloads, we will ask them to go with higher configurations. So that would be our four, five, six, seven engine configurations. So they could have higher payloads and even if they want to do right share with other satellites, we would provide a seven engine configuration that can also support uh, I think up to 300 kgs. Uh, so. Uh, so we have, according to our engine configurations, we can support different uh, orbital insertions. Okay, yeah. So, uh, once again, just like I've said every time, I am very thankful to uh, be here, thanks to the whole fraternity of SIA India for allowing me to participate and uh, giving me a chance over here. 
So let's uh, start with my question. Um, I have two questions. First one to Miss Arushi. Uh, yeah, my question was like, why exactly Ford engines? Why not fiddle with something else? Because uh, I've heard this that when you add more engines here, decreasing the risk of the failure of a rocket when you have a uh, engine failure. For example, uh, there are some companies, including SpaceX, that have like nine engines, even though they have uh, very less or very high payload needs, they still have nine engines because it's, it's obvious that uh, they are decreasing engine failure. And this happened once, but uh, still that flight was successful. So, why exactly uh, reducing engines? Why not something else? <coughs> yeah, I would like to answer that. Uh, actually, a good question. So, uh, we are considering seven engine cluster. Seven engines were decided based on our configuration, based on the maximum uh, orbit that we wanted to go and the payload capacity that we wanted to have. Uh, as you are saying, that having more number of engines reduces the chances of failure. That means we have some redundancy with respect to uh, engines. So even if our one engine fails, the other would be able to uh, handle the uh, mission. So that actually is possible. Why we wanted to reduce the engines was to reduce the cost of the mission. So if you reduce the number of engines, you will reduce the uh, avionics associated with that engine. You will reduce the, uh, you know, the, the bill of material associated with those engines and that is why you have lesser cost for that mission. But we also have an option <coughs> to provide you with more number of engines that would actually provide you a redundant engine. So basically that would mean that you can go ahead with the vehicle even if one engine fails. Okay. So it's, uh, it's optional? It's optional, yes. It's, it's okay. configured. Okay. okay. And uh, this one to all the panel members. Generally, uh, like, uh, uh, what's your name? Yeah, like Anapriya asked, uh, like, uh, where, which would be better, uh, small satellite uh, launcher or the light chair. I have a same question, but a bit more emphasized. Uh, with, uh, uh, like, uh, what should be better? Because uh, there are uh, two. Uh, these are two options which are both trying to prove cheap because uh, when, when the, when the you know, small satellite launchers came into the market, Electron, then Astra, and then uh, Virgin Orbit, etc., etc., they came into the market, they provided cheap services, and since then, the ride share companies like uh, 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 for example SpaceX or uh, for, for example SpaceX, any other company that provides right here, uh, they started to try being cheap by uh, uh, adding uh, by adding more services, lesser cost and I have even heard that they have done uh, you know, really emphasized right share. Like for example, this is a whole table considering it as one slot. And if... Uh Very quickly. You know, we're targeting to launch within just 72 hours. That's our target. You know, so we provide launch on demand facility. You know, when, where, where you want to go, where you want to go. Space. So these are the value-added services that we're offering. And in addition to that, why would a customer select? What are the enemy launch? Selection criteria. Uh, you know there are issues, there are advantages in offering favorable thing you should use. How you're arranging the contract. So those kind of advantages come in. Like how you're arranging the partnership with the customer. Got it. So, uh, so there are there are many parameters and uh, why and there is space for both. That's what. Right. Yeah, so that's all. I think that's uh, um, probably we can have offline. Yeah. Yeah, so, we so are out of time right now and there is a presentation. Probably we can, after the sessions, we can have one-to-one -one discussions. Probably. Sure. There is a presentation. So I thank my co-panelists.
for their wholehearted participation in the discussions and I am sure that uh, we have really got really enlightened by the insights that you had to offer on the space translation systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair, and all the panelists. Uh, the photographer can come, come and take the photo, and the uh, panelists may join the audience. We have a presentation from Tami Munisha M, scientist, UR Rao Satellite Center, ISRO. Uh, it's a five minute presentation. I request all of you to uh, kindly join the Sovereign Hall 1 after the presentation. Thank you.
uh, this uh, this has a problem with the observability because we cannot predict as accurately the geodesic parameters. But when airships are uh, given the uh, when the advantage of using airships, we can uh, put these laser transmitting or emitting uh, systems on the airships, and we can place it anywhere on the globe so that there is observability and there is no terrain constraint. Even on polar regions, uh, you can install the airship so that uh, the terrain is not a constraint here. And airships for disaster management. See, uh, the turnaround time is important. The satellite images and then it transmits the signal to the user. Uh, but if there is a delay in transmitting the information, then there is of no use. Especially this is uh, important during emergency situation. You cannot delay the information. So, uh, but there is a chance that the antenna may be physically affected uh, due to the calamities. But airships are placed above the weather uh, region so that they are free of in weather interference. And this information can be transmitted to users as quickly as possible. So airships are placed at an altitude which is, which is an added advantage and satellites can be seen even at negative elevations. Uh, the visibility is increased from 9 minutes to 14 minutes for a SSPO orbit and uh, data down download amounts uh, is increased by 55% for a SSPO and 45% for a uh, inclined orbit and then uh, it can be deployed at any place at any time and it can be quickly moved to any place of interest and it can be hovered with, uh, with lesser fuel consumption and can be retained in that place for longer duration and suitable for any type of orbit and it is all weather functioning cost effective ground station which can be considered thank you you saying that this is more like a data relay station in the sky yes sir it's a, you can do uh, telemetry telecommanding and range computing Thanks, Tamil Malaysia, uh, and congratulations on winning the first prize.